much of the book is set in a prison camp uh, called Ketzio in the uh, it's in the Negev Desert, right by the Egyptian border. And it was outside my frame of reference as a kid from Long Island. The day I arrived there, we had 6,200 prisoners, Palestinian prisoners. Everyone from the you know the, the junior rock throwers all the way to the to the founders of Hamas. I was lucky in the sense that um, when I got there, I wasn't made just a guard with a you know a gun and a tower. It, it translates rather comically from Hebrew as uh, as prisoner counselor, uh, which when I when I heard that, of course, the first thing I thought was that you'd be advising Islamic jihad terrorists how to fill out their college application. <laughs> and I made that pathetic joke to one of my commanders who didn't laugh and didn't get it at all. And I realized it was, it was that moment. I, 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 was, I was learning so quickly at this point in my life. I was learning so much about Israel. I learned that Israel holds the greatest concentration of unfunny Jews on the planet Earth. Uh, but I, I filtered that through, but I, I filtered that, that, that knowledge, which I think most people here would probably agree with, I hope. Um, I filtered that piece of knowledge, that observation, through the prism, I, I still, the prism I still use to sort of understand the world of Jews through this, through this, through this, through this very complex Zionism of, of mine, and and I felt okay with the fact that Israelis had no sense of humor, um, because I realized that why do Jews have a sense of humor as, as a self-defense mechanism? And I thought that that you know you don't need a sense of humor when you have an air force, and so that was a positive development an advancement in, in, in Jewish history, that, that you can have a country filled with people who are so normal that they're not, not cracking jokes and cracking wise as a defense mechanism all the time. And so I was in this prison, and prisoner counselor meant that I was really up close to these prisoners. I knew as a left-wing Zionist that there would one day be a Palestinian state, and I realized I had a chance to meet these people who are leaders, going to be the leaders of Palestine, and indeed, many of them, many of them are. Um, it's a huge section in the book about this and, and all the disconcerting things I learned about them and disconcerting things I learned about Israel and the conflict. There are also things that aren't disconcerting uh, that I learned. I actually, and you know, this is a, this is a debate that we can have whether these people became my friends or not, but I actually grew fond of a few of these prisoners. There's one in particular I write about uh, who, I, who I got to know quite well. His name is Rafiq. Uh, Rafi Kijazi, he's from the Jabali refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. I, I was uh, drawn to him because he, he was funny, for one thing, uh, which is also, you know, humor is not exactly the hugest commodity on the Palestinian side either. Um, I mean, talk about not funny people, right? Um, uh, and he had, he had this very, he had this characteristic that I found very, very charming uh, and unusual, which is the ability to be self-critical, because, uh, I mean, if, if if Israeli society is excessively self-critical, Palestinian society isn't self-critical enough. Because, of course, Palestinian society just being representative of Muslim society at all. One of the great dysfunctions of Muslim society, of Muslim societies today, is their inability to look at themselves squarely in the in the face and, and figure out what's wrong, what, what's gone wrong for them. At some point in early in Palestinian history, and even earlier in Muslim history, uh, the question shifted from, uh, how did we get into this debased position we're in to who did this to us? And, and this guy, Rafiq, was interesting in that he, he wasn't only, only asking himself who did this to us. He also had his criticisms of the Palestinian national movement. I felt that we were mirrors in a kind of way. I was an ardent Zionist who was critical of Israel's handling of the Palestinian uprising. And he was a devout Muslim and a, and a, and a, and a hard-headed Fatah nationalist activist. And so we had these conversations. But let, me, let me finish with this, because this is sort of, this brings us to the whole subject of, of the possibility of even understanding each other. The day, this is the day I sort of date my own mind as the beginning of my Middle East education, uh, when it really began in earnest. There was this um, really atrocious killing in the prison. We had, we had a lot of violence in the prison, obviously. There was some Israeli on Palestinian, there was Palestinian and Israeli. Most of the violence was Palestinian on Palestinian, because as you might remember, uh, by the end of the first Palestinian uprising, more Palestinians had been murdered by Palestinians and had been killed by Israeli soldiers. Uh, the hunt for collaborators, suspected collaborators, was, was all-encompassing and totally paranoid. And this, this infection of paranoia spread into the prison. And so in the middle of the night, in these tents, in these huge tents that we had the prisoners in, they would be interrogating suspected collaborators and torturing them and sometimes 
murdering them. They would bring the bodies out at first light when we were having our first count of the day, and they would invariably report that the person died in his sleep, even when there were barbed wire, barbed wire marks around the neck. I mean, they wouldn't even bother trying to cover it up. We all knew what happened. And there was this particularly horrible killing in a neighboring block the night before. And it was preceded by a lot of torture. And uh, it prompted me the, the, the following thought. It's a, you know, I, I thought, well, geez, man, if they, if they do this to each other, what are they going to do to me if they get half a chance? Because we were out number 20 to 1 in the prison, and I didn't even have a weapon. My weapon was locked in the bunk because I was in this job that took me too close to the prisoners to have, have a weapon. Um, so I thought, you know, what, 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 what's really going on here? So I decided to interrogate Rafiq about this question. I went, to, I went to his block, and I went over to the fence, and I called him over, and I said, I said let's just, um, let's just, I have a question for you. I just want to give you a scenario. Imagine it's five years from now. You're out of jail. I'm not in the Army anymore. And somehow we're both in Jerusalem. We both find ourselves in Jerusalem. And I'm walking down the street, and you happen to see me, and you remember me from being in the Army. Not only that, you remember me as your, literally, your oppressor. Like I was the one who had the keys, and I wouldn't let you out. Would you kill me if you had a chance? And, um, and he wouldn't answer, and I realized at that moment that there was a certain power imbalance in our relationship that I needed to figure out and rectify. And obviously he's going to be... And I, and I basically said to him, look, it's off the record. This, this is an off-the-record conversation. It's not, it's not the jailer in the jail. It's just two guys standing here in the desert. Would you kill me? And he didn't answer, but I pushed him on the point. And finally, he looked at me a little bit exasperated and said, uh, he said, look, if I, if I killed you, it wouldn't be personal. <laughs> and I realized then, and, and this is, you know, I've been on this, I've been asking the same question ever since, these, these same questions ever since in my, in my work. I, I realized that, that I was not equipped to understand the Middle East by, by my American upbringing, because I, I thought in the way that I was raised, that, that when you establish a personal connection with someone, when you break bread with them, when you talk to them, when you, when you, when you find the human qualities in them and allow, your, allow them to find the human qualities in you, that, that should trump religion and trump politics and trump tribe. And what I was learning in this place was that that didn't necessarily hold true in the Middle East. It's about the possibilities of reconciliation and the pitfalls of trying to reconcile Muslims and Jews. Um, but it's also very much about uh, coming of age in America as a Jew who was trying to figure out, uh, as, as a Jew who was trying to figure out the role of Israel and the role of being Jewish in, in his life. And, and so it's, it's these two things at once. I decided when I was writing this book, uh, and uh, I'm not trying to slag anybody here because there, there are great books about Israel. There are a lot of books about Israel. And the problem with most books about the Middle East, in, in, in my opinion, is that they're written by specialists, for specialists. Um, and that means they don't take the reader into account in two ways. One, the, the, the information is so detailed and esoteric that all but you know, anybody this side of Dennis Ross won't care. Um, and the second problem is they don't, they're not written with the goal of moving the reader the way a thriller would move the reader and, and get you through the book. Um, so I tried, it's up to you to decide whether I succeeded or failed, but I, I tried in this book to, uh, to make this a, an accessible story about a very inaccessible subject. And the way I did that was through, was by, by trying to be very, very disciplined about only writing about things that I have experienced or seen with my own eyes, rather than just sort of just dumping everything I know about the Middle East into this book. And so I thought it would be useful to start with my own story. Um, and to do that, and, and, and I thought that there was some utility in that, because I think that my story is not, while some of the permutations of it are, are a little bit Baroque, uh, the, the story is not a, a unique Jewish-American story. 